Hello Heath Church and welcome to the Wibbenant, birthplace of William Morgan, Bible translator. Uh, we miss you all and look forward to renewing fellowship with you. If you've got your Bibles this morning, turn with me to 1 Kings 18. Come with me to ancient Israel. It's a period of uncertainty, persecution, change, famine, violence, miracles, great faith, as well as great disobedience. Turn to verse 4. Thus reads the word of God. For so it was, while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them, 50 to a cave, and had fed them with bread and water. It was a dark time. The royal family were extremely wicked. Ahab and Jezebel, the king and the queen's regal influence, maintained a fervent idolatry in the land. The fourth verse tells us, doesn't it, that Jezebel was a preacher murderer, someone who sought to silence God. There's nothing more serious. Um, there may have been a famine in the land at the time, but there was also a famine of the hearing of the word of the Lord. If I thought of a theme for this short meditation, it would be the cave and the two mountains. Uh, and it'll become apparent why I've chosen that title very soon. Chapter 18 begins with Elijah being commanded to present himself before Ahab. As he travels, he encounters this curious figure called Obadiah, who is mentioned in scriptures being in charge of his, that is Ahab's, house. Verse 3 there. What follows is a lovely bracket, an aside where we're told that he was a God-fearer, a believer, and that faith turns out and becomes heroic action. He hides God's servants in two caves. Not only does he hide them, but he feeds them. It might remind you of those wartime films where brave men and women hid Jewish people. And I can't help but mention my wife's grandfather, who um, hid in the Netherlands for some years, I think, in an attic. And the SS would come, knock at the door, and they would bayonet the roof, the thatched roof now, to see if there was anybody hiding. Yet I, I thank the Lord that he was preserved, because if he had been found, it's unlikely that my wife would be here today. So this cave, what, what do we learn here? Well, the Lord preserves his people. His word continues. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the building of Christ's church. But what about the mountain? Uh, in chapter, later on in the chapter, we're told about Mount Carmel. And do you remember how God revealed himself in fire? What followed? Um, it must have been revival, you might think. A great turning back to God. Not so. Uh, we find the prophet later on in these chapters wandering towards the south. He's sad. He's depressed. And my friend and I up here were thinking recently, was it, it surely it wasn't just the kind of fear of Jezebel, although he may have been afraid. I think he must have been so disappointed. Do you remember in Deuteronomy 18 where Moses talks about a new prophet that would be raised in Israel? He, he was, of course, speaking about our Lord Jesus, a prophet where the words of God would be in his mouth. We were meditating and thinking that perhaps Elijah thought that he was going to be this new prophet. Who knows? Maybe he thought after the victory at Carmel that things would be great things would be uh, wonderful. Like Wynne was speaking on Sunday, there would be uh, a, a lovely revival, as it were. But things were not like that afterwards. In 1 Kings 19.10, he goes to another mountain, to Horeb, to where God had met with Moses. And he is honest with God. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with a sword. And then he gets very honest. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. 
Had Elijah forgotten? I don't think so. Uh, we're not certain what happens between the two mountains. But what we do know is that God doesn't change between the two. The Lord doesn't come in fire on Horeb. Look in verse 12 of 1 Kings 19. He comes to him in that still, small voice. Brothers and sisters, divine silence is not an indicator of divine inactivity. And what's lovely is after God reveals this truth to him, he comforts him further by saying, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. 7,000 what? All whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. What can we learn from the cave and the two mountains? Well, surely uh, God reserves his people. His church will be built. Why do you think it's Elijah and Moses that appear next to our Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration? Personally, I think it's because Moses was lawgiver. He exercised great faith during uh, seeing the fire and the Red Sea. He stood still and saw the salvation of the Lord. And Elijah, well, Elijah, yes, experienced those fiery miracles. But he also exercised faith during the still times. If we can learn anything from this period of lockdown, surely is that we must keep trusting in the Lord, even though things seem so still spiritually. God seems afar, um, I, doesn't he? We've got to be honest. But who knows, maybe after this period... He may reveal to us that there are in fact 7,000 who have not bowed the knee, as it were. Wouldn't it be great if after this period, this still period, the blessing would come again to our land? I finish this talk um, with those lovely, encouraging words by our Lord Jesus, who understood us better than anyone. He says, doesn't he, blessed are those who believe in me, who have not seen me. Do you remember those words? Jesus Christ, our Lord, he knows what it's like when it seems he knows of everyone what it was for his father to turn his back. And although it feels at times that the Lord has turned his back on us, we have that wonderful promise in scripture, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So even if it be by fire or by the still small voice, like Elijah, we have that lovely promise confirmed in our Lord Jesus Christ that he is with us always. Thank you, and it'd be lovely to see you again soon. Bye-bye.